A big welcome to the GLF session, Understanding the Interconnectedness between the ongoing Desert Locust Crisis 2019 to date and the climate crisis, co-hosted by the Think Tank for Sustainability, TMG, the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, IGAD, the Sweater Center at the Arizona State University, and the German Federal Ministry for Economic uh, Cooperation and Development, BMZ. I'm Svante Nilsson, and I welcome you today to a perhaps at first sight very specific perspective on our dramatically changing planet, that of the still ongoing desert locust crisis. This terrifying crisis is very real, but it will also enable us to discuss how transboundary crises in times of climate change could be tackled better. In 2018, higher temperature in the Indian Ocean led to extreme weather events, eight cyclones from 2018 to 2020 alone. Even the so-called empty quarter, a desert in the southeast of Saudi Arabia, filled with lakes, vegetation, and enabled desert locusts to breed, to gregorize, and eventually to start migrating as swarms. Since then, vast regions have become afflicted, putting livelihoods in jeopardy, first due to the upsurges, then to combating measures taking their toll as highly toxic pesticides impacted not only the locusts, but also environmental, animal, and human health. The locust campaign is still ongoing. Kenya, for example, after 70 years without an upsurge, is presently bracing itself for a third wave of desert locusts. Desert locusts have populated a vast number of narratives, collective images, and language. But what does reality look like? And what does the present crisis teach us about our fast changing planet? Is climate change a novel root cause? And do we have to brace for more frequent outbreaks? And if so, how? At TMG, we believe that only if we understand the interconnectedness of the crisis better, we can learn to mirror it with the best possible response. Are the systems in place already based on cutting edge technology? Are our responses geared towards resilience? Are the afflicted communities prepared to act the best possible way? Or are emergency measures at times even undermining resilience and spurring even more problems? So what can you expect from today's event? We have lined up just some of the very engaged experts pragmatically dealing with the crisis. They feed firmly on the ground with examples from Kenya and Ethiopia, all of them thinking outside the famous boxes and working beyond the equally infamous silos, striving for the best possible solutions geared to what's resilience. Our amazing speakers all work in the interface of research, governance at different levels and media. Over the coming 90 minutes, we want to provide you with information, even squeeze into videos and an intervention from the German ministry BMZ, all to set the scene for our panel that will discuss the still ongoing campaign, first experiences and lessons learned, touch upon, upon early warning, early response, the impact of combating measures, especially of pesticides and their true costs, in order to make invisible costs visible. Then our concluding panel of experts will bridge these insights into the world of governance and a future in which response systems will less have to make up for inaction, but invest in action upfront. Again, in a nutshell, hopefully give us a first glimpse on how we could start paving the way for a more resilient planet. How can you participate? As audience, you will be invited to use the chat function to exchange thoughts, but also to direct your questions to our panelists. Time flies, and therefore we have to decided to have one Q&A session to follow the main panel. We also invite you to follow the provided links and look out for the uploads the GLF will provide for after this amazing and timely conference. I feel honored to have had the pleasure of welcoming you and will now resort to the unhappy role of timekeeping and passing the floor. Because now Dr. Elena Lazutkaite, an interdisciplinary research and animal scientist with TMG, and Dr. Adam Prakash, an economist specialized in machine learning for climate change and risk management solutions, will introduce you 
to the ongoing Desert Locust campaign. Ellen and Adam, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Sancha. I shall share my screen. Yes. So I shall start this presentation by looking at the origins of the ongoing desert locust crisis. Our world is facing an unprecedented level of extreme events impacting people and nature. We are facing the ever increasing frequency of severe weather events, epidemics, as well as outbreaks of transboundary pests, such as the desert locust. A number of record-breaking disasters are showing us clearer than ever before how interconnected we are, for better or worse. The United Nations University recognizes the ongoing desert locust upsurge as one of 10 interconnected disasters in the recent years. Alongside COVID-19, bleaching of the Great Barrier Reef, the Arctic heat wave, and Amazon wildfires. Researchers suggest that conditions favoring desert locust outbreaks will likely occur more frequently in the future, and there is no species on the planet that respond as quickly and as dramatically to favorable conditions as the desert locust. Desert locusts are biphasic, a term referring to ability to take on completely different forms. In their solitary form, they are benign, but under particular conditions, they transform into gregarious insects. They exhibit swarming behavior, devouring all vegetation in their path. An adult locust eats its entire body weight every day. In just one day, one square kilometer swarm can consume as much food as 33,000 people. And these swarms are often much larger. So swarms can join up with other swarms forming gigantic clouds of locusts. And one mega swarm measured in Kenya in 2020 was nearly the size of the country Luxembourg. The damage such a swarm could do is huge. The fiscal costs of the current campaign against the desert locust could amount to over 1 billion US dollars. Furthermore, the World Bank estimates that damages and losses could amount to 8.5 billion US dollars in East Africa and Yemen in 2020 alone. About 5% of total regional GDP. And we should put these numbers into further perspective. We are talking about countries that are amongst the most economically vulnerable in the world, also that are the most exposed to climate change and have high population growth rates. And that is not the whole story. Emergency control measures are exerting external costs on the environment and human health owing to extensive use of toxic pesticides. How did it come to this? The origins of the current desert locust crisis can be traced back to an irregular oscillation of the Indian Ocean Dipole, IOD. The IOD governs sea surface temperatures in the Indian Ocean, and in the positive phase, the Western Indian Ocean becomes warmer relative to the Eastern part of the oceans, which can trigger cyclones and extreme rainfall. The IOD was in positive phase in June to December period in both 2018 and 2019. In October 2019, the dipole reached its most extreme positive level in 40 years. That is illustrated on the figure on the right hand side. When the first storm cyclone Mikuno hit the Arabian Peninsula, it filled a vast desert in Saudi Arabia, Rub al Khali, also known as the empty quarter with fresh water lakes. Arguably, the most culpable factor in allowing this crisis to transpire was that multiple generations of breeding were not controlled in remote areas in Saudi Arabia empty quarter. And in favorable circumstances, desert locust populations can multiply 20 fold every three months. In summer 2019, 
the insects began to migrate from the Arabian Peninsula into the Horn of Africa. As the locusts moved through East Africa, the region was also hit by unusually wet conditions, as well as more cyclones, allowing the swarms to grow even larger. Overall, the Horn of Africa was hit by eight cyclones in 2019, the largest number in any year since 1976. And locusts are passive flyers, and the cyclones provided winds that enabled the locusts to travel rapidly over long distances at small energetic cost. By the end of 2019, there were swarms recorded in Ethiopia, Eritrea, Somalia, Kenya, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Egypt, Oman, Iran, India, and Pakistan. And now I shall hand over to you, Adam. Oh, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Dr. Adam Prakash. I just want to thank Helena for the previous slides, which gave us um, some of the stylized facts of the um, ongoing um, crisis, the, the Desert Locust Crisis. Now, I'm going to delve a little bit deeper and come up with some discussion points for the panelists. And um, so, first of all, I just want to introduce some key concepts and control. Now, these are all progressive or uh, should we say aggressive um, in terms of what they achieve to do. So at the beginning of the hierarchy, um, the, the most optimal solution or uh, control is to have outbreak prevention. Now this will comprise um, a high functioning early warning system, okay? Uh, with lots of technology behind it. Um, we also, in this uh, mode of control, we there are no there is no room for chemical pesticides, the toxic toxic pesticides. We don't have any crop losses, and there are only fractional fiscal and environmental costs. Now, moving on to the next one, orange. So we're in a bit of a dangerous territory, and the reason is that we use chemical pesticides to control disparate swarms from developing. Um, into upsurges and plagues. So uh, yes, the primary control method is chemical pesticides, toxic again, we have crop losses and the costs to both um, government budgets and the environment, they begin to escalate. And then finally, um, red, this is the country's last line of defense. When you have a swarm coming over your country, all over your borders, the only thing that one can do is to unleash huge amounts of chemical toxic pesticides. We have huge crop losses and um, there are massive, massive fiscal and environmental costs and also to human health imposed under this um, type of control. Now, moving along, as I said before, um, in the current campaign, it's been the last two methods of control that have actually exemplified um, what has happened to date over these past few years. So again, I've alluded to the use of toxic pesticides. Um, there's a list of them and they are all highly toxic according to PAN. Now, the status quo, what has been going on is no longer tenable. The reason is because climate change is with us and it is expected to trigger more frequent and intense transboundary outbreaks of locusts and other pests. So I really want to emphasize this is why we are here because climate change will bring about these future incursions at a more frequent pace. So we want to argue for a new paradigm uh, basically there are three components to this. One is the effective early warning system, which I alluded, alluded to before. We need to have effective environmental monitoring and the big word governance. So coming back to the, coming on to the first, uh, uh, what, what you call element in the paradigm is a well-functioning early winning system, okay? Now, um, this is a highly innovative system that we would like to propose and it will include the use of satellites um, to gather um, intelligence data 
on the ground as well as um, to do with the weather. We need precision drones, robotics, um, modern management tools, and this will all bundle together will actually protect livelihoods and bring about, bring about better resilience for, for everybody, including the environment. Now, um, environmental monitoring, we can do this through the concept of true cost accounting. So here, um, we want to make invisible costs visible. And uh, we'll focus here on the biodiversity loss associated with uh, the use of um, chemical pesticides, particularly with regard to pollinate, the loss of pollinators, um, environmental pollution. Uh, we can have runoff or uh, contamination into waterways uh, and human health costs if people become directly exposed to these chemicals. So basically the TCA approach, the true cost accounting approach can uncover uh, the true costs, the environmental costs, the human health costs, which hopefully will alarm policymakers into action or into reform, because the status quo is no longer tenable. And finally, we need a better model for governance. What was, has been missing um, in the campaign to date is the lack of regional coordination, the lack of re regional governance. We, we need to stop countries reacting in silos when when speed and time is of the essence to inter intervene before um, locusts turn into um, uh, swarm behavior and they invade, if that's a word, a, a whole region, which has happened, what we've seen to date. We also need, most importantly, a new business model, a new mindset. We need to uh, build resilience for all communities, as well as for nature's defense mechanisms. So once again, just want to stress the importance of governance. Anyway, thank you very much for your attention. I'll now pass the full floor to uh, Swanche. Thank you very much. Um, so thank you. Elena and Adam for at least having tried and started with your presentation. Now we have the honor um, to, to greet Sebastian Lesch from the German ministry BMZ. He's in charge of sustainable agricultural value chains, international agricultural policy, agriculture and innovation. As you can already hear, he is with big future themes. Sebastian, please take the floor. It's all yours. Thank you very much, uh, Svante. Sorry about the technical difficulties. I'm trying to bridge uh, the gap a little bit. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. This is really an exciting uh, session uh, that's being restarted here. Uh, why should we care about desert locusts in the context of climate change? Why do I care so much about uh, desert locusts? Um, Germany is the second largest bilateral donor. So of course, what we have is a huge investment uh, in the area of rural development, agriculture, food security. It's one of only five core topics that we're following uh, as a ministry. So obviously we have an interest in the sustainability of what we're doing. Now, we're looking at multiple crises. There's a food crisis, hunger crisis, there's climate change, there's a biodiversity crisis, there is COVID of course. So it's obvious that uh, the result of the work that we've been doing in terms of achieving SDG2 is acutely in danger. There is that. Now, combating desert locusts in that context is crucial as it is of course because it threatens millions of lives and livelihoods, as we have seen in the presentation. But there's more to it even, I think. Those crises are not individual crises, one next to the other, one to be tackled after the other, but of course they are interlinked. If we look at the topic of this session, that's quite clear. Locust causes hunger, climate change exacerbates the locust crisis, as has been shown in the presentation, fighting locusts with pesticides, then again ruins biodiversity, and so on and so forth and so forth. So these crises, these multiple crises are at the same time quite a bit overwhelming. Now, what we need to do, of course, is we need to be breaking down those global conversations that we're having, not least in Glasgow right now, about all those crises. We need to break them down to individual cases in order to be able to tackle them. And I think Locust exemplifies that particular situation. Now, I'm not a scientist. We'll be hearing from scientists uh, later on uh, and we're supporting them uh, passionately as a ministry, ECP uh, is among them. Um, so for me, it's not about the technology of how to fight that locus that is the focus of my interest, but it is the governance aspects of this. How do we deal with that overall situation 
in terms of governance. Um, and that's interesting, not only in terms of locus, but that's interesting, of course, in terms of a scalability. Any result on that can be potentially applied to other crisis situation or multi-crisis situations um, as well. Now, FAO has achieved a lot over the last 50 years. Uh, there has been a huge investment in cooperation, the building up of structures, but the situation is as it is. It demands that we must act faster, we must act uh, more coordinated, we must share information better, we must work on the governance of the system, we must pay attention to that last mile, how to bring solutions that we do know about to the field or to their application, and we need all hands on deck. And that's why it's great to have that many stakeholders from all the parts of the system, all the levels of the system here today, science and research, the uh, private sector, civil society, multilateral, national, regional institutions. So where do we take it from here? I'm really looking forward to this session because of course there's a lot of questions out there. How can we be quicker in transforming the scientific the key of knowledge, what we know, into practice? What are the levers that we need to pull? This is about early warning. This is about a quick reaction also to that early warning. Then what is the mechanism we're talking about? Who's involved? Is a government-centered approach what we're going to need? Is that going to be enough? Do we need a multi-stakeholder approach? How can we involve science, the civil society, the private sector in order to be as quickly in our reaction as we need to be? What are the advantages and the disadvantages possibly of a multi-stakeholder approach? Then what precisely is it we are doing as financiers of the system? Can we invest in locus prevention rather than in the fight against a locus crisis once it's there? The earlier we know about the problem, can we do things more sustainably, more biodiversity friendly also? And then what is it we need to invest in? Who can contribute what? government, multilaterals, the private sector, who has an interest in contributing and what is that interest? And then I think lastly and most importantly, what can we learn from this for agri-food systems overall, for their governance overall, as well as for their vulnerability to climate change? Those are not small questions. Those are the big overall questions I'm trying to raise here. But I think the case of locust makes it possible to look at them in more detail and to learn how to tackle things in the future. So I'm really thanking Team G for organizing this and I'm looking forward to a very interesting discussion. Back to you, Svante. Thank you so much, Sebastian. And it's been amazing how you could bridge in this difficult situation that is a virtual one, but more live than we might have expected. So also thank you to the audience for staying with us. Thank you also, Sebastian for your expectations that mean faster, better coordination at the same time, ensuring a truly joint effort. I think, um, yes, we will discuss it during the panel, but now we wanted to make sure that we give you a glimpse of what's really happening on the ground. So thanks to FAO, you will be watching a short video on Food Hero in Kenya. Elena, please start the video. Kenya. Our country is highly dependent on agriculture. When the locust invasion came to this country, it was a menace. <laughs> Their food is pasture and the crops that our countries depend on. I came to be the officer in charge of the servicemen who were selected to go for the, the desert locust control operation. Since this desert locust menace came into our country, the National Youth Service has been in the forefront and the delivery has been so well. What is the best time for spring? When a family goes to the farm and what they had farmed has been eaten up by the desert locust, this means there is going to be hunger. If the grass that they depend on for their cattle, sheep and goats has been taken or eaten away by the desert locusts, this means there will be reduction of the meat and the milk that these pastoral communities depend on. We were trained on how to gather information on their behavior, on their movement and how to even fight them. 
we leave for the operation at around 5.30 so that we can reach the fields when the sun has not heated up. On reaching the field, we have to know the specific swamps that are there, how large the swamps are, which swamps to target first, any information that we get on the ground. We put it down in the application and we forward it to the center, command control center that is with FAO. If the National Service didn't go outside there, the kind of destruction that we would have experienced would have been vast. So that was a very interesting video. I'm really grateful that it had subtitles because the tone was an issue again. So with all the technical issues, um, we are very grateful that you're staying with us. Please also use the chat function to a little bit be on, on the safer side and also to gear up for what is going to happen now because we try to set the scene, as you know, just to start the discussion and it will start obviously with the panel. I have the pleasure to introduce Mark Davis to you, a truly interdisciplinary researcher with a vast professional background. After many years at FAO, he is presently primarily with the Center for Pesticide Suicide Prevention at the University of Edinburgh. Mark will moderate and first thing introduce to you his panel and questions and answers segment. So please use the chat function as much as possible because this is your segment now. Mark, you have the floor. Thank you, Swancha. Uh, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, greetings to, to all the participants, uh, and a particularly warm welcome to our panelists. Um, in, this, uh, in the next 25 minutes, or 35 minutes, in fact, um, we have four panelists, four experts from various fields um, who will present their particular perspectives uh, on locus prevention, control, operations, uh, and in particular, what we're interested in discussing is how could things be better? How could we prevent the swarms and the, and the consequential damage that's taken place in East Africa uh, over the last couple of years and continue, uh, as we have heard? Mm -hmm. um, so to begin with, uh, I would like to introduce the first of our panelists, Anne Miner. She is the National Coordinator uh, at the Biodiversity and Biosafety Association of Kenya, BIBA. Anne has been actively working on challenging force solutions being pushed in Africa, such as genetic engineering, biofuels, the push for a green revolution in Africa, and carbon markets as a strategy to cope with climate change in Africa. She has been very instrumental in the growth and development of networks, such as the Eastern and Southern Africa Small Scale Farmers Forum, uh, participatory ecological land use management, and the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa, as well as other networks in Africa. So Anne, I'd like to pose a question to you. The high use of pesticides to control desert locust swarm was clearly aimed at saving crops and protecting farmers' livelihoods. At the same time, those locust control operations have an impact in terms of economic cost, their impact on the environment and, and, and on the health of people who are exposed to those chemicals. Do you have an assessment of what the true broader costs of these control operations are in relation to the, uh, to the benefits that they deliver to the communities that you are uh, so closely working with? Over to you, Anne. Thank you very much, Mark. And uh, thank you to everyone who has joined us this uh, afternoon in Nairobi. Um, uh, one thing that you need to realize is uh, after se almost 70 years, uh, the desert locust uh, invasion happened in Kenya from 2019, after what we've, uh, we've had a lot of the presentations on what happened. But uh, Kenya and the, our government was quite, quite, quite unaware uh, because 70 years later, there was not much equipment, not much expertise, not, not aircraft and uh, sufficient knowledge to manage uh, the issue of the desert locust. And so we found a situation where uh, multilateral agencies like FAO came in and supported uh, the government in trying to control the desert locust using uh, pesticides. Uh, some of these pesticides, we have raised uh, questions about them. For example, uh, 
chloropyrifos and uh, others. And uh, like for example, chloropyrifos is banned in Europe and in some states in the US because of the, of the danger that it causes on human health. It's an organophosphate, quite uh, toxic. And so in terms of looking at uh, the, the, bio, the dangers that happen to the biodiversity, to the environment, we saw cases of, of communities reporting um, loss of pollinators, for example, bees. What was happening is that the desert locusts affected a lot of the northern part of the country, where we have uh, high hotspots where there are lots of bees from stingless bees to the stinging bees and all these, and a lot of uh, honey production. Subsequently, in 2020 and uh, in 2021, you're hearing communities complaining that there's reduced uh, uh, honey production, uh, reduced mango production in the, in the areas where they produce mangoes because of the lack of pollination. The challenges related to this toxic pesticide is that uh, uh, there, there was both uh, aerial spraying and on-ground spraying. We saw from the video, the National Youth Service in Kenya supported FAO in going out in the field, spotting the, the swarms and uh, managing them by spring. Unfortunately, not much training had happened. This was an emergency. And in a case, for example, in Samburu, you found a case where they, they, they sprayed almost 34 times above the recommended uh, uh, spraying of the pesticides that were being used. You can imagine the impact that this had will have on the community, on the land, and this pesticide generally uh, flow and go mm -hmm. into our water systems. And the effect on the health will not be seen now, but in years to come, because you, you've seen uh, from a lot of the uh, experiences in Europe, the challenges related to the toxic pesticide, the increasing cases of non-communicable diseases. And also the impact on wildlife in some of the areas like Marsabit, communities were saying wildlife that are uh, fed on this, uh, toxic pesticides, this, the grasslands that uh, were sprayed with these uh, toxic pesticides, they could see cases where some of them lost their, they, 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 they died. And so you can see the, the challenges on biodiversity because of the use. Of course, it was a challenging situation. Right now, it's actually, uh, we are seeing cases of reports of more swarms coming in. Uh, just this week in the media, there are more swarms coming in, and this is quite uh, dangerous. There have been uh, some biopesticides that have been developed, for example, metahesium uh, from 1998. Uh, unfortunately, this is, uh, most, this is said to be a slow uh, working and works on the, on, the, on the younger hoppers, on the younger population. And so one of the other challenges you see is that uh, companies are not ready to produce this. And it's the multinationals which are producing the likes of uh, chloropyrifos, uh, malation and others which are being used in spraying uh, the desert locusts. And so the impact is there. Uh, there was a study that was commissioned by FAO, an assessment uh, on environmental impact of spraying uh, the toxic, uh, the, the locusts. Unfortunately, this is not yet public. And so the cost you can see and the cost and the impact of the spraying will take, we will see it many years to come. Uh, we are currently conducting a study on the impact on some of the communities you're working with. And uh, this, this we hope we'll be able to show some of those impacts, but already communities uh, are reporting such cases of reduced uh, pollinators and uh, loss of biodiversity. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. That's, uh, that's very informative and, and, and quite concerning. Um, Let's, let's see if we can put that into, into a slightly broader perspective and see what can be done in terms of prevention. I'd like to move on to Emily Kimaki. Emily is the Geospatial Research Officer at the International Center of Insect Physiology and Ecology. <coughs> Emily has vast experience in the use of, uh, of GIS, uh, global uh, geographical information systems, earth observation and geospatial modeling tools to enhance crop insect pest risks, monitoring and early warning systems for integrated pest management she holds a master's degree in climate change and adaptation, a bachelor's degree in, in geography, and a postgraduate diploma in project management. She recently published a research paper on predicting prediction of, of breeding regions for the desert locust in East Africa. Uh, so this, um, this paper that you have published, um, in relation to the advancement in satellite technology, machine learning, remote access, 
using drones and robotics. What do you see, Emily, as, as the future for the prediction of breeding sites, early warning, and early control of locusts to prevent some of the problems uh, that we've just heard Anne Minor describing? Over to you, Emily. Okay, thank you so much, Mark. Uh, it's an honor to be part of the discussion. Uh, so uh, ICPE, which I'm part of, is a, it's an international research organization whose major mandate is to uh, research and develop uh, you know, alternative pest management strategies. And uh, ICPE has been part of the Desert Locust work decades before the invasion uh, even came to East Africa. So there are so many technologies that have been developed by ICPE, one of which is the biopesticides. Uh, you've heard about the metarhesium and uh, the semiochemicals, so many technologies and ways to harvest the desert locust. So the modeling and uh, gene information team uh, at ICPE uh, came up with an ecological niche model. So I was, uh, I was part of the, of the, sorry, I designed the, the, the model. So we came up with a model to try and understand uh, the ecological niches of the breeding sites of desert locust in, in East Africa. So as you've had, uh, it was quite new. It was an, an invasion that had not happened for many, many years. So we did not have any field observations as at the time we were uh, conducting the research to, to come up to understand the, the niche. So what we did is we leveraged the data that had been collected by FAO, uh, the Desert Locust Information Service. They, ha they have a huge archive that they've, they've collected in the Sahel region and uh, the Middle East and Western Asia. So we tried to, do, to come up with a model to try and understand what are some of the ecological variables that are, are favorable for the breeding of the desert locust. And through that, we were now able to project those conditions into East Africa to try and understand which are the similar, uh, the regions with the similar conditions uh, to that. Uh, this model was very successful. We were able to validate the model using the data that has been has now been collected over time. And uh, for sure, uh, you can you can there's a huge correlation between the regions where the invasion happened and the and the and the areas where the model showed a very high suitability of desert locust. So there's a huge potential to leverage the data that we have, the field observation, the satellite data that is available to us to come up with models uh, to, to predict. Because uh, as much as we may have all these technologies that have been developed, we need to understand in time to be proactive, to know where we can channel uh, these interventions. So uh, a lot of evolution has gone uh, has been going on on the on the satellites. We, uh, as time goes by, we get to have high quality satellite images. Uh, there's been an advancement in the spatial and temporal resolutions of this satellite. Uh, we've had a lot of um, data coming in from NASA, from European Space Agency. And so if you're able to, to combine this data with the field observations, with the weather data, you know, the, the monitoring station data, we can leverage all these and come up with, you know, utilize the available machine learning algorithms and, uh, you know, the models, the, the ecological niche models to come up with a strong and accurate uh, earth uh, early warning system to be able to guide uh, the policymakers on where to channel the intervention and to also, you know, increase efficiency in planning and decision making. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. That's that's uh, that's encouraging. It, it it shows that we are definitely moving forward. We're using the technologies that are available. I'm going to move on now to uh, Keith Cressman. Keith Cressman is the senior locust forecasting officer at FAO. Um, he's been working there for nearly 34 years. Uh, providing forecasts and early warning to countries uh, and he is FAO's top expert in this field. Uh, FAO for those who are not familiar is the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Uh, he's established innovative early warning systems for the tran for transboundary pests uh, including fall armyworm, red palm weevil and of course desert locust. He began with FAO in Sudan during the last desert locust plague. Uh, before that he worked with USDA uh, Department of Agriculture uh, on cotton pests and was a Peace Corps volunteer in Tunisia. He's trained in biology uh, and international agricultural development uh, and plant protection. So Keith, FAO plays a, a central, a key role in monitoring the environmental conditions and the realities of locust breeding and movements. Uh, the systems you've set up yourself are state-of-the-art what more do you think needs to be in place to prevent the recurrence of desert locust swarms, such as those we've seen in Eastern Africa and in the Arabian Peninsula over the last couple of years? Over to you, Keith. 
Thank you, Mark, and, and welcome everybody. Um, yes, indeed, as, as you mentioned, of course, um, FAO operates um, probably the, earl, the world's um, oldest um, early warning system for any migratory pest. So this is extremely unique. Um, the early warning system um, uses um, latest technologies, innovations, um, the models that, that Emily has just been talking about are integrated into the system. Um, we use digital tools um, for, for people in the field to collect data in real time, transmit that by satellite um, or by internet um, connectivity. Um, satellite imagery is, is used in this early warning system to, to monitor rainfall, vegetation, um, soil moisture, again, as Emily was, was mentioning. Um, drones now are starting to be used to help the teams in the field find areas of green vegetation where locusts might be. Um, models. Um, such as trajectory dispersal models of swarm migration are used, um, breeding models to estimate hatching times and development times. Um, and all of this, this kind of data flow um, uh, feeds into a near instant analysis of data. And that's absolutely key for, for, for desert locusts. You know, in the last upsurge that we're facing now in the last two years, um, there's been 16 new innovations to this system. Um, thanks to our partners, partners like Penn State University, uh, NOAA, NASA, the UK Met Office, ECMWF, Cambridge University, Hamburg University, um, ECP, of course, um, Columbia University, um, JRC, um, and many, many others. And, you know, this system works, but it's not fail proof. Um, you know, there's been 18 outbreaks since the last upsurge um, in 2005, and none of those outbreaks turned into an upsurge like we face now. So it does work, but it's not, again, fail-proof. So what do we need more of? Um, and this comes exactly to what Sebastian was talking about, governance. We have to turn this early warning into action. So what does this require? It requires a continued investment in the preventive control strategy, you know, to prevent outbreaks, upsurges, and plagues, which relies, of course, on robust early warning and the ability to do, you know, a rapid action um, in response to, to needing of locust control. And at the same time, we have to be prepared to fail that they will, we will have to face emergencies, increasing emergencies probably due to climate change and other um, aspects. So this really requires strengthening of national capacities and regional capacities. Um, there is a need for preparedness in a changing climate. There is a need for national ownership and good governance. There's a need for security. And we often forget about that. You know, mm -hmm. places that are um, unsafe are not accessible. So it cannot monitor the locusts, cannot undertake those control operations, whether they're chemical um, control operations or operations using biological pesticides, uh, biological products that are available. And you know, the other thing we forget, Mark, is that there's a need for fast, stable, and affordable internet. Because you know, we've heard about the, the, the requirements of sharing data of information of, of the early warning system I, I've been talking about. That all um, uses the internet. And some countries don't even have the internet or they have such a slow connection. And we saw today even the problems, the challenges involved in, in, in relying on the internet. So a huge investment is needed um, in Africa and in Asia on, on the internet. And lastly, of course, all of this needs to be sustainable. So it needs to be brought into the national legislation system so that you can secure annual budgets for the ministries, for the national locust centers so that they can operate because these are the key players. So um, in a nutshell, it's, it's sustainable monitoring, it's sufficient preparedness, security and internet, and turning early warning into action. Thanks. Thank you, Keith. That's, that's a fantastic summary and, and, uh, and again shows that uh, uh, many of the, of the elements of uh, viable solutions are in place, but as you say, they're not entirely fail safe, and, and that's maybe something that we need to be focused on. Um, our next panelist is Dr. Tadese Amera Sahilu. Um, he's the executive director of PAN, the Pesticide Action Network in Ethiopia. Uh, he is trained in sanitary sciences, uh, has a degree uh, in environmental health, a master's degree in public health, uh, and a PhD in environmental communication. He worked for seven years in the Ministry of Health of Ethiopia, 
as District Environmental Health and Health Education Coordinator uh, on a wide range of public health issues. And for the past 15 years, has been working in public interest civil society organizations uh, and is currently, as I said, the Executive Director of the Pesticide Action Network Ethiopia. And Tadesse is also extremely active in international networks of, uh, of organizations that are concerned with environmental issues, chemicals management, and public health. So Tadesse, a question I'd like to put to you. Um, the ultimate and most devastating impact of locust swarms is the destruction of crops, as we've heard. Um, often those of smallholder and subsistence farmers, such as uh, many in your country, Ethiopia. From your experience, are farmers satisfied with the levels of control that are being provided by government institutions, such as the Desert Lo uh, Locust Control Organization uh, mm -hmm. in Ethiopia? And if not, why is that the case? Over to you, Tadesa. Thank you very much, Mark. And thank you for the organizers uh, for inviting me uh, to be part of this interesting panel. Um, are the farmers satisfied? They are not really fully satisfied because um, it's the, the locust uh, control program needs a regular follow up of the situation uh, on the ground. And locust, as you know, is not appearing every year. So the, 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 good, predict, the good approach is if you have a report that uh, says that locust is not appearing, that should be appreciated. But the system fades up and uh, funds are not really satisfactory for uh, early warning, scouting, and for, for following up uh, monitoring. And also uh, in making uh, awareness creation activities at the community's level. And when the communities uh, uh, face lo the locust problems, uh, they don't have uh, any clue on what to do because they have low level of awareness. And in some areas, what we face is when uh, the locust, uh, the first thing starts to appear, especially the pastoralist communities hide because if they report, they feel that the, the pesticides will come and there will be high amount of spring uh, in their grazelands and the cattle will be affected and uh, human health will be affected. So by the time they hide, uh, the swarms uh, will appear and it will be uh, gregarious and they cannot hide it. By that time, the thing is that they fear the aerial spraying and high amount of pesticide application comes and uh, all the grazelands and cattle and human uh, together with the locusts will be affected with uh, pesticide uh, application. As you know, the pesticides that are used for a swarm are really very dangerous and highly hazardous to human health, cattle, and the whole biodiversity. So the, 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 the thing is, the problem is making the communities well aware of uh, early warning systems, reporting when the first three stars come. And if they report that uh, in, at early stage, that will be controlled in those small areas uh, mechanically, or with um, a few application of pesticides and uh, even they can be part of the process. But this is not well uh, organized and uh, there needs to be well organization of this with the communities, uh, making them aware of early warning and early reporting saves uh, them from uh, the, the, the fear that they have of high, high amount of pesticide spray. So all in all, the, the, the communities, the farmers, and especially the farmers where they experience the, the locust appearance every year are not really fully satisfied, but it's possible to make them satisfied by making them aware and by creating awareness and by making them part of the system in reporting. Um, and if they are involved, it can be reported by phone and it can be reported even with the local agriculture uh, department system and that can be early uh, managed. So uh, this is a gap for the LSEO and Ministry of Agriculture not to satisfy the communities in that aspect. And this is one uh, thing that I would also rec recommend uh, to tackle this problem. Back to you. Uh, Mark. 
Thank you so much, Tadeza. That's, uh, that's really interesting. That's, you know, the farmers need to be involved. Otherwise, in fact, they can work against the initiatives that the governments are trying to, uh, to implement. Um, so back to you, Anne. In fact, um, the, uh, the, the, the control of locusts, obviously, is done by national, regional, and in some cases, as we've heard from FAO, global institutions. Do you think that farming communities are sufficiently consulted and engaged in these processes? Uh, and how should they be more closely involved? Thank you once again. Um, like in the case of the desert locust, um, when the when the first swarms were spotted in 2019, um, farming communities uh, there was no time, or rather, I think it was not there was no sufficient time to consult them. And generally, uh, the communities are not well consulted because. Uh, what you find often is that technocrats, policymakers sit in the, in the cities uh, or in the counties now, we have county governments in Kenya, and they make decision and they say we are going to spray. Uh, the bringing in of the National Youth Service to, to help in scouting and doing that was a good thing because it would help in that kind of communication. But you find that communities in some areas say that uh, the, the swamps came, but uh, there was no uh, there was no one to consult with, there was no one to, to inform about that. And at the end of the day, they came, they ate them, they grazed on the, they ate on the pastures and they destroyed the crops and they moved. And the communities are left there suffering. I think it's important even as we deal with other uh, challenges that come in. For example, we have, uh, we've had in the past like issues related to the fall annuum and all those. Uh, the government, our national governments develop systems where proper consultations are done with the community. Sometimes it's an emergency situation, like in the case of the desert locusts. And then 2019, 2020, we had the challenge of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, with the lockdowns uh, staying for months and uh, people not being able to share that information easily. Uh, we also have a challenge uh, with the, at the ground because uh, our county governments and the national governments, because of the many challenges that they are facing, not much uh, uh, money is put into hiring of extension officers. So the extension officers previously used to act as the go-between of the agent there who would uh, notice a lot of these challenges and pass them on to the, to the government at the national level and uh, react to them. At the regional level, I think IGAD uh, has been doing some a lot of work on uh, issues of uh, locusts, even uh, FAO, and uh, at the at the international level, linking and uh, that information sharing. But a lot more needs to be done in terms of inform of communities being able to inform uh, the scouting, the consultation, because also communities quite often people find uh, local communities uh, rather assume they don't know what's going on but the communities are able to give a lot of feedback. So that participatory research is very important. And I'm happy that ICIPE is here because uh, that's one of the things I think they have been quite strong in. Uh, for example, the development of the push and pull technology and others. And so calling upon uh, that more collaborative research to support and uh, help in some of these challenges and uh, that, are, that are coming in, for example, the desert locker situation. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Um, and so we are hearing uh, we are hearing that the, what, what you're saying uh, from the experience in Kenya is very similar to that from Ethiopia, uh, and this is important. Because communities, farmers need to be involved in these processes, uh, and not uh, just uh, considered as victims um, that are uh, entirely in the hands of uh, of government or regional organisations uh, that are uh, institutionalised to co to control the locusts. Um, I'd like to come back to Emily, and um, you mentioned that there was a long gap between the, um, uh, the last lo uh, lo desert locust uh, swarming outbreak in Kenya, uh, 70 years, you said. Um, of course, it's extremely difficult to maintain the institutions in that interim period, uh, and you, you spoke about that a little bit. Um, so I'd, I'd like to you know, come back to that and say, well, what do you think needs to be done in order to maintain those institutions and, and ensure their effectiveness uh, in what could be extremely long periods uh, of recession. Um, and to add to that, in fact, there's a question from uh, an audience member, uh, which maybe you can respond to as well. Uh, 
which the question is, is the ongoing upsurge showing geographical and temporal patterns of invasion that can be considered different from past plague periods of desert locusts? Um, so if you could uh, quickly respond to both of those uh, questions, I'd be very grateful. Over to you, Emily. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. So yeah, for sure, like, uh, like I said, and Anne has also alluded to it that Kenya, uh, as of 2019, we had not experienced any invasion. So there was no infrastructure that was uh, set up at the time. So there was a lot of panic. There was a lot of reaction uh, mechanisms to manage it. So uh, you know, moving forward, we've seen uh, sort of a cycle of uh, the, the, the invasion. So we had the invasion in 2020. And currently, we have some swarms that have come in from, uh, from Somalia. So uh, as of now, the, the, the governments and uh, other partners uh, need to, should have come up with uh, a very strong uh, early warning uh, <clears throat> sorry, infrastructure to be able to manage uh, the pest. So uh, speaking for ICP, I would say a lot of research efforts have been done to try and uh, come up with you know, alternative ways of managing the pest. So as I spoke with, uh, about the biopesticides, we've come up with different isolates of metarhizium that can really manage the pest at a fast rate. We have harvesting you know, techniques to harvest the, uh, the, the locust, but all these are very effect if effective at the hopper stage of the, of the locust. So we have to manage the pests at the hopper stage, at the new stage. And these also assist in the reduction in the amount of the pesticide that we need to apply in these regions. So what I can say is that there needs to be a lot of synergy between, uh, between the governments, because remember, this is a transboundary pest. This is a pest that cuts across boundaries. So, uh, you know, the swarm that comes in Kenya, obviously this uh, comes from Ethiopia and Somalia. So the way in which Somalia and Ethiopia manages the pest will have a huge impact on the level of infestation that comes into Kenya. So uh, we need to you know, break the silos, as you had uh, uh, alluded before. We need to break the silos. We need to work together as a team. There needs to be a lot of coordination, a lot of communication, a lot of outreach to the people in the area to understand uh, what needs to be done. And the early warning, the early warning is the start of everything. It's the linkage between all these four effective harvesting, effective application of pesticide and, and the pheromones and all these wonderful technologies that have been developed. We need to have a very strong uh, early warning system. So from my side, what I can say, you know, to tackle such a dangerous pest uh, like desert locust, we need a very strong coordination through effective communication, monitoring, near real-time early warning, proper governance, all that to ensure, uh, you know, effective application of interventions. Uh, to answer the question from uh, from the from the chat, uh, well, uh, our model as of now it was more of a static model, but we are still working on uh, do, uh, developing a time series analysis to try and understand the trends that have been going on, uh, you know, in the in the region to see if there's there's a there's a pattern. But definitely, even by looking at the at the updates from FAO, you can see there has been a trend. We had uh, the first outbreak in the uh, towards the last uh, December of 2019. We had another outbreak uh, at the last same case in 2020, and we can see some uh, swarms coming in uh, in November, which means there's a projection that, uh, that there could be more swarms coming in towards the end of December. So there's been a trend, uh, but we're still working on the models to try and understand the the models, uh, the, the trend, and also focused on what could happen in future. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. And, and great to hear about the work that the CPA is doing and, and the fact that you're there doing this, this kind of research. Keith, I'd like to come to you with two questions from the audience. Um, one of them is, is, is asking, um, is climate change going to change the range uh, of these pests and the, and the breeding sites? Uh, and another question from the audience says, are there similarities or parallels between, um, for example, armyworm invasions and desert locusts that you can uh, relate to? Over to you, Keith. Sure. No, of course, you know, under, under climate change, the scenarios are um, increased temperature, and, and that's fine for desert locusts. Um, but much more interesting is the increased um, frequency of severe um, weather. In other words, um, heavy rains, widespread rains, cyclones, and these things. And, and these type of severe weather events, this is what um, trips kind of a normal situation into, into a locust emergency. What, what moves a, a locust outbreak to, to an upsurge um, level? 
And we've seen this in the past as very well um, documented, demonstrated. So if we start to see, for example, more um, cyclones um, coming into the Arabian Peninsula or into the East, um, East Africa because of that Indian Ocean diapause, Diapole, then likely we will see an increase of, of locusts um, upsurges in East Africa. Now, in addition, of course, climate change may have some impacts on wind patterns. And, and that could um, then you know, carry locusts to, to new areas, places where locusts normally don't go to now because you know, they, they migrate with the winds. So I think there's a lot of research that still needs to be done on, on climate change um, impacts um, on desert locusts. Um, but I, I think we, we, we can be, um, uh, we understand that you know, locusts have already gone through climate change probably several times in the past, and they've done quite well. So um, we, we need to better understand then, you know, what impacts those will have on, on our um, strategies and our um, preventive control um, measures that we take. Uh, now, the, the other question, um, Mark, sorry, remind me again, what was that? <laughs> Uh, are there any parallels between other migratory pests such as armyworm and, and, and locusts? Ah, yes. Um, you know, initially, when armyworm came into Africa in 2016 and started spreading throughout Africa, there is a lot of parallels with locusts because, you know, armyworm was extremely migratory. They set up um, monitoring systems. They, they had notions to forecast um, armyworm movements. But the great difference between armyworm and desert locusts, for example, is that armyworm now has become a resident pest. It's just another pest that's on that long list of, of pests and diseases that farmers have to manage in, in her crops you know, every year. And, and that's different than, than desert locusts. As you heard Emily said, you know, locusts have, have um, affected Kenya twice in the past 70 years. Um, very, very different than armyworm. Armyworm will be in, in, in Kenya, of course, every year. It's not much more of a migratory pest now. It has become a, a resident um, pest. But, you know, all of this points to, I think, um, Mark, that, you know, there is a lot of technology and techniques and models and, and, and these things that people um, are working on that are integrated into the early warning system. Um, you know, some of the best modelers in the world are, are working on these things, and they're finding that it, it's really challenging. You know, desert locust is a very clever um, uh, pest. So we can't just think that you know, gizmos and technologies are, are going to be the magic silver bullet here. You know, as um, Tedesi mentioned, you know, more awareness of communities, of national authorities, of even international partners, um, getting uh, villagers um, and communities and farmers involved in the monitoring system would be absolutely um, key, I think. I think that's one area that we can uh, improve upon. Um, another area is, is you know, building that very important human knowledge, that human capacity, because it, it doesn't matter how many fancy technologies we have, if, we don't, if they're not being used sensibly by us as humans, th then we could um, end up making some very poor decisions, and, and that could be costly. Thank you very much, Keith, and I think those are really important messages that feed well into uh, coming back to Tedesse, maybe. Um, Tedesse, Pan has been critical of, of uh, the heavy use of pesticides for uh, uh, locust control. Um, and uh, we've heard about the importance of engaging uh, communities. I'm just wondering, I mean, this is, and this is going back to some of the, we're getting many questions in from the audience. And unfortunately, we're, we're rapidly running out of time. But maybe you can say something about this. Are there any farming techniques? Have you found that some farmers are more resilient in terms of uh, the impact of pests such as locusts or other migratory pests? And um, are there crops that maybe these pests are not going to eat uh, that maybe are worth farmers considering um, to protect their livelihoods? Um, and again, uh, coming back to the, the points that Keith just made, um, how can we engage uh, the donor communities and, uh, uh, and other international organizations as well as national governments to create more effective prevention strategies so that we don't see these massive upsurges and the impacts on farmers. Um, so over to you, Tadesse. Thank you, Mark. Um, first of all, the, the, the first failure is um, locusts are not, as I, I, I said earlier, locusts are not appearing every year. And there are times that countries did not experience locust appearance for five to 10 years. Um, looking at this, Governments and donors may be fatigued to finance the system, the scouting, the regular monitoring. Uh, 
it doesn't appear for the last five, 10 years, doesn't mean that it will not appear. If you miss for a season, a disaster will come. And that disaster is not only for the country, it's also for the neighboring countries, as has been said. If something happens in Yemen, it will be for the whole uh, Horn of Africa. If it appears in Kenya, it's for the whole Horn of Africa and even it goes beyond. So there should not be a fatigue of the donors to finance the regular monitoring systems. Uh, the regular monitoring system can be established with uh, scouts uh, in locus prone areas. We can have local communities, part of the local community to scout regularly and to report. And when they report, they don't see any uh, indication of locust coming, that should be appreciated. That should not be something negative. What we want is not to see locusts, but if locusts are not reported for 10 years, donors, government officials, they don't want to finance that. And when locust comes, a lot of money is coming in and vehicles and technology and everything. So this should not be uh, the case and it should be reversed. The second one, what I suggest is also establishing uh, an early warning system to be consistent, even in years that do not have locusts. So this should be regular, consistent, and there should not be fatigue with the no report. That should be reported very well and appreciated. Uh, and the final comment I would have with this regard is establishing a mechanism for early control system. If there is early reporting, if there is early warning system, what will be the early control system? Do we have the communities equipped with the system and the mechanism to control early without using highly hazardous pesticides and affecting communities? These are the main things that, that uh, uh, we, we, we really appreciate and we uh, work with the Minister of Agriculture and the LCO in Ethiopia, a civil society organization. Uh, with the question that came from the audience with regards to uh, are there communities resilient to this? There are communities when they see uh, some indications of locusts, they just report to the local agriculture departments and to the, to the Desert Locust Control Organization. Desert Locust Control Organization is a 50 plus years uh, organization for the whole Eastern Africa region. So they are doing very well. And uh, they, the, if it's reported there, they can mobilize the communities in a way that communities can handle that in mechanical way and mobilizing the communities. There, there may not be uh, use of a high amount of pesticides. With regard Thank to- Thank you so much, uh, Tadessa. Unfortunately, okay. we, we, are, we are out of time. Um, there have been so many interesting questions coming in from the audience that we, have, we haven't had the time to respond to, and maybe we'll find a way of, uh, of getting some written answers out. Um, the input from all of our panelists, um, from uh, Adese, uh, Amera, from Keith Cressman, uh, from Emily uh, Kimera, and uh, Kikimati, and from Anne Miner, um, have been informative. Uh, have been very complementary to each other. Uh, the messages are strong and clear. Prevention clearly is better than having to deal with the locusts by spraying pesticides into the environment, um, but maintaining and sustaining those uh, effective prevention measures needs input from many sectors um, that at the moment is not entirely sustainable. Uh, and that's perhaps where the focus needs to be in the future. Um, I thank all our panelists again for their time and for their important contributions to this discussion. Uh, I wish we had more time to continue. Unfortunately, I now have to hand back uh, to uh, our facilitator uh, and uh, to continue the discussion and allow some of the other speakers we have on board uh, to present their perspectives. Thank you all again. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you to you and the panelists. You have just been amazing. And yes, it's now becoming a lively discussion and we would like to continue. In fact, we are a little bit running late, but just due to technical problems. So we've been allowed to extend the session a little bit and please stay with us, also the audience. I also want to just ensure that everybody is aware of that there will be links um, mentioned in the chat. So you will maybe a little bit later, if you find time for it, uh, be able to access also the presentation that you could not 
fully enjoy because Elena and Adam had to stop it due to those technical um, problems I just talked about. We will also try to inform you via the website the GLF and the TMG website, including a white paper that we provided for this session. So you will be able to learn more and also hopefully to engage uh, with us. So now, uh, before we uh, hand over to the last and concluding panel, uh, we want to follow up with a short documentary. And I think it's just spot on when I listened uh, to the uh, discussion between uh, the panelists um, and also Mark, and that's a documentary on disaster resilience by the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, uh, IGAD. Uh, please, Elena, start the video. Can I just check if you see the YouTube? Yes, but uh, you can enlarge it, please. Yes. Gavora and Luvene, Loni Demofakunka by a beer wet. A month and a more Hakarduet in Devre, Loni Lonum Lama. Hana Moha Manta or Hetchies, and Hadue of Jerenim Bay, Nagum Bay or Hetchies. This story is not unique in East Africa. The region often faces multiple hazards at the same time. The region is disaster prone and vulnerable to extreme conditions like droughts, floods, pandemics, and outbreaks like the desert locust. Climate change is making the situation worse, bringing more frequent extreme events to East Africa. <laughs> In the past, responses to these disasters were mostly focused on solving the crisis after an event like this would happen, rather than trying to prevent the impact of a disaster. To reduce impact of disasters, EGAD Disaster Risk Management Programme focuses on changing the way of thinking from reactive to proactive. For example, EGAD has founded the EGAD Climate Prediction and Application Centre that, among other things, optimises early warning systems. EGAD has also created training programmes and teamed up with other organisations like Red Cross Society of Kenya. Hadde si kasta wax kasta oo aan qabsan karna ee sida horoma aha ee hadda wax kasta oo faa'iido aan ka heli karno waan ka seena marka wixi aan faa'iido ka helayno waan garanayna wixi hadda faa'iido aan qasaartay faa'iido aan ka kala helayno hadda faa'iido gaar ah oo ilmo ku beelan karno The support of EGAD does more than preventing mitigating and adapting to disasters. It even catalyzes change and lets communities profit. EGAD reshapes risks into opportunities for better lives in the EGAD region. Thank you very much, Elena. This worked perfectly well. And with this, I feel much touching video. The floor is surely now prepared for our last panel to bridge to governance issues and pave the way into the future, as we understand this event to be a kickstart for integrating prevention and management of transboundary pests and diseases into climate adaptation and governance geared towards resilience. Let me personally thank you for today the audience, the panelists, everybody active and behind the scenes, including the technical support and interpreters, and hand over to Alexander Müller, founder 
and managing director of TMG to conclude this event. I wish you all a good day. Alexander, you have the floor. Thanks a lot, Swantje, for introducing me. I received the message that I cannot start my, now I'm back. Thanks a lot, Swantje, for introducing me. Uh, we are now in the closing session of this side event called Understanding the Interconnectedness Between the Ongoing Desert Locust Crisis 2019 until today and the Climate Crisis. And I'm really happy that in this closing session, I have the opportunity to discuss the ongoing desert locust climate crisis, but also the implications for the governance of adaptation and resilience together with two real experts and friends. First, let me introduce to you, to you Kathleen Merrigan. She is the executive director of the Sweaty Center for Sustainable Food Systems at the Arizona State University. And Dr. Ahmed Amdihun, a regional program coordinator for disaster risk management at the International Authority on Development uh, Climate Prediction and Application Center. With both, I would like to have an interactive debate about what have we learned from this event and what are the consequences beyond the topic of desert locust in the region? Let me introduce the debate with a very few sentences. The desert locust outbreak, the, the, the desert locust plague, is adding additional threats for vulnerable, for vulnerable people and negatively impacting their food security. We have seen the evidence, we have discussed it, and the movie made it very clear. But we know that because of changing climatic conditions, because of the climate crisis, this is not only a local or a regional problem, this is a topic which is intrinsically linked of how, to how we are dealing with climate change. And therefore, in the session now, I would first like to invite Ahmed from uh, IGAT to briefly explain to us what he is doing in his disaster operation center in the situation room where you are trying to deal with outbreaks like desert locust, but also droughts and floods. And then I would like to invite Kathleen to discuss with the two of us what kind of governance is needed so that we can broaden our understanding of adaptation to climate change and integrate outbreaks like desert locust and other species. Ahmed, first of all, thanks for joining us. Please, could you please explain what are you going to achieve with your regional situ operation center? How are you dealing with the challenges and what lessons can we learn? Over to you, Ahmed, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Alexander. It's a pleasure also for me to join you today uh, in this interesting discussion uh, about um, the interconnection, the nexus between climate change and also the desert locust. Uh, let me start by um, bringing to, uh, the attention, to your attention that uh, Things are really, really important to be considered to be starting from a policy and strategy perspective. Uh, where I'm coming from, the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, the most important thing is now uh, uh, the regional strategies and policies, the national strategies. Are they really uh, up to the job, up to the task, up to the challenge? That is, I think, very important. And uh, I'm very happy to report that IGAJ has uh, aligned strategy recently to uh, the priorities of the global Sendai framework, which is basically on risk reduction, as well as on the Paris Agreement priorities as reflected in NDCs and so on. Uh, uh, Alexander, one most important thing is now we have to start from understanding the risk itself. How we look at it really matters. Uh, and this is clearly reflected uh, uh, at a regional level. Uh, if you look at, for example, uh, the way we talk about the nexus between climate change and uh, uh, more severe uh, hazards and um, uh, you know, more frequent, more severe hazards, you realize that uh, there is something that we have to ask ourselves. Have we really understood uh, the issue beyond the hazard? That also involves issues of uh, 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 vulnerability, issues of uh, elements at risk or what we call exposure. All those things are quite important. Number two, 
uh, it's also quite uh, essential for, for um, actors to, to have a robust risk governance uh, mechanism in place. That is, again, quite essential. Here we are talking about institutions uh, that are proactive, guidelines, operating procedures in place, and they know what to do when uh, a disaster or when an, an alert is you know, uh, given. That is, again, quite essential. Uh, just two points. Uh, one is on the investment side. I think uh, a colleague from FAO has raised it. Investment on resilience is quite important. Uh, here, uh, Alexander, if you just look at the East Africa region, uh, the story is quite, quite uh, mind-blowing. It's uh, billions and billions of dollars on emergency response, while preventive and uh, risk reduction, early warnings, anticipation, all those are funded at a few millions. I think this narrative has to change. As you have, as you have heard from the video also, the documentary, we are re really, really interested to change this narrative. More investment on anticipation, prevention, and mitigation of uh, uh, the disasters and their impact. That's quite, quite important. Finally, uh, the preparedness aspect, I think, has been said uh, several times. But preparedness is not just for um, an impending disaster. We have to prepare also for response, how we respond properly uh, and promptly to uh, any impending uh, disaster. That's why, actually, we have uh, just launched our situation room a few days back. Uh, we call it a IGAT Disaster Operations Center situation room, where we are uh, setting to uh, issue a multi-hazard early warning system to, to, the, to, the, to the region, particularly to the countries uh, that IGAT is uh, uh, serving. Uh, in this regard, uh, we also are set, particularly for early action um, activities, most importantly on uh, putting in place mechanisms, guidelines, protocols on early action. Uh, early warnings without early action is really uh, as good as nothing. So it's important, again, we as uh, intergovernmental authority and all stakeholders uh, come forward and, and, and invest in early action. Uh, I'll stop there, uh, Alexander. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, I would like now to invite uh, Kathleen to also join us and to switch her video on uh, in order to join us for, for the discussion. Kathleen, can you hear us? I can hear you. I don't have control of my video. Okay, so may, I, I would like to ask the, the technical host to allow uh, Kathleen to also join with her video. I had the same uh, issue, but while, while you are please continuing to try to, to join via video and the host will allow you to do it. Uh, we have used the example of this terrible uh, outbreak of desert locusts coming from the empty quarter close to Saudi Arabia, uh, Kenya with one of the worst desert locust outbreaks over the last 70 years. And we have heard during the debates that we will have to face other and more frequent outbreaks and they are related to climate change. This raises the question to me, how do we integrate the prevention and the fight against such outbreaks, locust, desert locust, drift valley fever, fall army warm and all the others into a governance debate, trying to support the regional and local level by kind of a global governance. Kathleen, do you have an idea how we could best do it? <clears throat> yeah, that's a big question, Alexander. Hello, everybody. I mean, I certainly want to start by um, agreeing with what has been said, this idea that uh, how do we move from reactive to proactive and uh, the locus is just uh, an amazing example of how we haven't figured this one out in terms of global governance. And I also want to concur, Alexander, that this is just one of many crises that we have to figure out how to manage better. So what to be done? Uh, the, um, you know, every, everyone's excited now being in Scotland and thinking big thoughts. The problem is everyone goes home and there's not enough teeth and the different kinds of agreements that we um, come to. The way government's budget uh, doesn't um, facilitate this steady kind of resources that are needed to deal with locusts and other crises. So the very mechanisms of, for example, how the US 
government budgets is not um, uh, it's not adaptable to the ways that people are suggesting. It really needs to be um, reconfigured. So it's a bigger problem than locus. Uh, so I'm just reasserting that, and we have to um, we have to somehow get world leaders together to understand that we need a new mechanism to um, to have a steady flow of resources and workers in the field to um, to deal with these uh, pest outbreaks. The um, <laughs> the the challenges though to get them to agree are just immense because as you and I have talked about before, the sort of new kind of international governance is almost no governance at all. And so we're really taking a blank page in some ways and asking people to be very creative. I do wanna uh, do a shout out for my colleagues at Arizona State University. People may not realize, but we have a global locus network that's run by our Global Locus Initiative. But this is not governance of using governments. It's really a research network. They have 150 members from 36 countries trying to connect stakeholders and intelligence about Locus. They have a private platform uh, cleverly called Hopperlink, so people can reach out to ASU if they want to join that. But that's not going to be the substitute for the, the big kind of global governance call that you're making. So there, there you go. I got up in the middle of the night to tell you don't, I don't have a grand answer to this, but I do think that we have to have something new if we're gonna succeed. Thanks a lot, Kathleen. Let me try to, to follow up before I come back to Ahmed. First of all, thanks for getting up in the middle of the night. Seems to be three o'clock in the morning in, in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, but I want you to talk about the costs of early warning. You, you raised it, how governments and international organizations are budgeting and how much money they are willing and able to spend for being prepared. What we have to discuss is how expensive is such a desert locust outbreak in, outbreak in reality? We have seen figures from FAO. Thanks, uh, Keith, for having put this together on the website of FAO. The World Bank is reporting about billions of damages uh, because desert locusts were uh, eating up all, all plants and then putting people into severe food insecurity. But there is more. There are environmental costs, there are human health costs, and they are not budgeted for. We know that the use of highly toxic organophosphate pesticides has impacts on biodiversity. It has been presented. And therefore, I think we have to do better calculation. We have to look at the true cost of such a desert locust outbreak. It might be true that a well-staffed and well-prepared early warning system with action and early uh, and, and prevention might be a lot cheaper if we take into account the true cost of such an outbreak. Kathleen, we have worked together on true cost accounting. What, what is really needed in order to make all hidden costs visible? <laughs> a, a lot of good thinking, but you're right. You're pointing out the problem that we capture in the at least American expression, people are penny wise and pound foolish. So we ultimately pay much more uh, than we would need to if we had a common sense approach to locus. Um, the true cost accounting effort, if people have not heard about it, has been going on for a number of years, Alexander being one of the leaders of the crew, where we've been trying to bring together scholars across the globe to think about methodologies to um, reveal the true costs of food production and locus is related to that, of course, not because we want to make food more expensive, but because we want decision makers to have full transparency on the decisions that they make, hopefully because they make better decisions, but if they don't, so that the public has a means to hold them accountable for those decisions. There's just too much about what we do that remains hidden, un unvalued, and um, bringing the true cost accounting frame to locus is one way, as you're suggesting, Alexander, that policymakers and private sector leaders 
would then be confronted with the full uh, knowledge of what this uh, erratic funding toward the locust problem and other sort of problems in, in pest management create. And maybe then they would alter their decision making. So yes, hopefully that, that would be uh, something, but I still think you have a problem the way government spends out money. And, and, and it would really have to be a very strong case to get the politicians to fund when there's not a crisis. So the narrative that we need to make that case has to be incredibly compelling along with the true cost accounting. Perhaps we get there. Thanks a lot, Kathleen. Ahmed, my, may I ask you to come back and switch your video on again and maybe the three of us can stay together. So you are one of the front runners with your regional disaster operations center and your situation room. What do you expect from the global level to better support your regional work and what kind of, you mentioned in governance, would you need in order to make your work more effective and also trigger new research so that we can do better in the near future. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Alexander. I think um, one most important thing uh, I emphasized is the issue of uh, collaboration. I think uh, risks such as the desert locusts are transboundary in nature, but before they are so, I think uh, we have to also look at it uh, from a systemic point of view and cascading impacts. Uh, the best example is actually the COVID case and uh, desert locust. When it is in Asia, for instance, are we able to put uh, our, ourselves you know, in the front line to be able to act quite in advance? That is quite important. Uh, coming to your question, Alexander, um, when we talk uh, about um, global partnership, I think we have great ideas, as I have uh, explained, particularly in putting in place uh, anticipatory actions forecast-based uh, actions, including financing part, uh, we really wish to collaborate and advance this agenda of shifting uh, uh, the operations more to crisis management to more of uh, preventive uh, approaches, anticipation and preventing and mitigating impacts before they really uh, take a toll or on, or on our economies, uh, on, on the livelihoods, on the assets, key infrastructure, and so on. Uh, if you look at our region, uh, Alexander, um, there are usually multiple uh, disasters at the same time, uh, creating a compounding risk to, uh, to, to, to the low economies uh, in the region. So uh, we would be very happy, particularly to call uh, on, on international partners to come forward and work with um, uh, EGED uh, to try to put in place a robust uh, 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 preventive, anticipatory uh, uh, approaches to this to this task. We are very much working closely with the countries and would be uh, happy to collaborate along that line. Thank you. So, thanks a lot. Uh, coming back to you, Kathleen, having heard this strong call from a regional coordinator, and what I would like to highlight is your disaster operations center is not only dealing with desert locusts, that's a big challenge, but you're also looking at other climate related, related topics. Therefore, I have the strong feeling that adaptation to climate change has to be thought through in a new and innovative way. So far, transboundary pests and diseases are not really integrated into the adaptation efforts. We do not really think about how to do early warning. We do not really think about what kind of prevention and early action has to be done, sometimes in very difficult areas of the world where you have civil war and unrest and you cannot access it. And what we also have learned today is that we have to replace highly toxic pesticides with a huge uh, impact on the environment and human health by biopesticides, so we also need a type of new public-private partnership to develop less toxic or non-toxic pesticides. Kathleen, th this calls for an international process, transparent, inclusive, linking 
questions of global governance for adaptation to climate change with the regional and national needs. So far, I don't see it. And what we would like to trigger from this debate is how can we kickstart it? Is, what, what is the, your experience in, 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 in your current position, but also your previous position when you have been state secretary in the Ministry for, for Agriculture in the United States with these type of, of governance processes? Yeah, I really love to point to some shining example. That's the success story that we can all model off. But I don't, I, I don't know what that is, Alexander. I think it was, you know, 25 years ago or more that I did work at uh, Harvard and MIT in their program on negotiation and did a, a, a case for people to use to think about these issues uh, around the transboundary uh, uh, water issue. So the, the era of climate um, that we're in means that we're going to have to have uh, different governance mechanisms, regional, um, regionally based and globally uh, constructed and funded that deal with transboundary issues. We do not have we don't have the answer in place now to point to and applaud and say, let's replicate that for locusts or let's replicate that for you, you fill in the blank. Um, it's not there. And uh, in terms of the biopesticides, I know certainly um, from my work over the years, it's an extremely underfunded area because uh, it really, um, uh, these biopesticide companies don't make a lot of money, so they don't get the venture capital and the investment capital that they need to really succeed. And so you're really looking at small amounts of government funding to really help support the industry, these small research grants. It's just not getting the kind of investment that would ever, you know, come up with the solutions that would really, um, you know, knock off the organophosphates as the answer uh, to uh, a locust crisis. So it's not just about early warning systems and a steady flow of resources, people uh, on the ground understanding what's going on, but that whole research uh, domain really needs to be dealt with um, on a global governance level because the private sector and biopesticides needs uh, needs a lot of help to to get to where we need to be. Thanks a lot. Uh, we have three more minutes and what I would try to do is to summarize it in two minutes and each of you can add and Ahmed you are beginning please your comment in one minute. So my I'm convinced that we are talking about a very interconnected problem climate low cost poverty, food insecurity, cloud, droughts, sometimes floods. This requires a new type of integrated early warning system that allows to globally support national and regional efforts to, to tackle these challenges. And would you, and that's my question to you, would you join an effort if we after this session start talking about how can we link early warning highly innovative with satellite images and, and uh, machine learning with analyzing the true costs of such an outbreak in order to make clear that the cost of the action is much higher than the cost of appropriate and timely action. What kind of first step would both of you do? And that's my question so that we can kickstart such an endeavor. Ahmed, you have the opportunity within a minute to change the world. Thank you very much, Alexander. <laughs> um, uh, yes, I think that's very, very interesting. Uh, the point is, uh, Alexander, particularly, uh, we have no option. We, we have to do this all together. We have to use the best available technology, uh, the best available experiences that uh, each of our institutions have, including uh, convening uh, capacities of our institutions uh, and jointly address this. And uh, as I indicated, I think Iger would be very much um, uh, interested and you know, would be happy to collaborate in bringing those uh, high-end technologies in addressing uh, uh, hazards, not in, uh, in an isolation, but in a more multi-hazard integrated way. 
Uh, that's actually the direction we are taking, and uh, uh, I really appreciate uh, that we uh, discuss this further. We don't stop it here uh, and bring something uh, very, very uh, groundbreaking to out of this uh, conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Ahmed. Perfect. Kathleen, please. Well, I think we have to um, get this these transboundary pest issues on the climate agenda. I know in my own country, we're coming um, out with all kinds of investments around climate resilience. And we've got to work on the narrative and the true cost accounting of these kinds of problems to make sure we're on the agenda. Thanks a lot. I would like to close with quoting my former colleague, Keith Grassman from, from FAO. He just informed us that the cost of the last 2003 to 2005 upsurge in Western Africa, so three years of upsurge, was equivalent to 170 years of preventive control. 170 years. So if we do a true cost analysis, we will see what has to be changed and how we can improve the livelihood, let's not forget it, the livelihoods of the most vulnerable people here in the world. I would like to thank all of you. We know that climate change is a multiplier of already existing risks. It creates new risks, but we have to be able to work together in finding new answers. And I think this side event and the collaboration between you, Ahmed, and your center, and Kathleen, and, and the Sweater Center could be a start to try to develop something new. I would like to thank all participants for having joined. I would like to thank the interpreters. And I hope that the next event we are going to conduct will have a little bit better technical conditions because in the beginning we had a problem. And I see now that all other participants are joining so that we can have a full picture of those people who are involved. I would like to thank the whole team behind the efforts. Thanks to BMZ, Sebastian Lesch for having supported us and having uh, allowed us to tackle such a, a, an issue which is not, not, not easy to discuss. I think we all can be happy with the outcome of this event. Thanks to all of you, we will stay in contact and we will try to not only share new ideas, but also work together in order to change things. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot to all the people behind the scenes for having made this possible and have a good day. Thanks. Thank you so much.